Yeah, okay. So, I guess let's uh, get started here. Welcome everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, you are tuned in to the New Orleans Game Developers Monthly Meetup. Uh, my name is Curtis, I will be your gracious host this evening. Uh, we've got quite a wonderful uh, event for you tonight. Uh, before we get into it, I just gotta take care of a little standard business. Uh, so if you've never been here before, you've never seen us before, this is New Orleans Game Developers Meetup. We meet uh, the third Thursday of every month uh, right here on the internet. Um, so anywhere you are, it's it's really more than just New Orleans at this point, although it is mostly people from New Orleans, but y you could be anywhere. Um, but thank you for joining us. We, we meet monthly, third Thursday of every month. You can join our Discord which um, if you're watching the stream live, uh, there is a link in the YouTube description. If you're not watching it live or you're in the web seminar, um, someone will provide you a link in the Zoom chat. Uh, it's a great community, great place to be, a lot of smart people. Uh, you talk about making games and, and what that takes and how great it is. Um, and as uh, one of the, the captains of the, the community, uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, so, without further ado, I don't think we have any other business to talk about, so we can just get right into the, the thick of it. Uh, this month we're having a, a little educational summit here. We've got leaders of education in our uh, state and city and general area, um, and I have a list of names next to me and I'm going to introduce them in the order of that list uh, you give your you know just say say who you are where you teach um, and then after we introduce everyone we'll go one by one and you can talk about your programs and whatever you want to say I think you can screen share too um, so from the University of New Orleans we have uh, Dr. Ben Samuel uh, hello yes uh, I'm Dr. Ben Samuel from the University of New Orleans <laughs> um, it's an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you tonight, uh, and I'm really excited to share my little PowerPoint slides and tell you about my program. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Thank we you. have uh, Claude Richard. Is it Richard or Richard? It's Richard. Richard, okay, from Delgado. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Claude from Delgado. I advise for the Computer Information Technology uh, program, including game design. So thanks for having me. Thank you. We have uh, Mr. Donald Gramillion from the Academy of Interactive Entertainment. Hi, yeah, I'm Donald. I uh, teach uh, game art and animation at our two-year college, uh, AIE, or Academy of Interactive Entertainment. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Mark Abinell from LSU. Hey, this is Mark from LSU. Uh, welcome to the uh, stream tonight, and hopefully we'll have a good conversation. And uh, last but not least, we have Mr. John Fraboni from Operation Spark. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Great to see everybody uh, here. And uh, I, I'm, I run Op Spark. And... Uh... Actually, excuse me. I think I forgot to also introduce my compatriot, uh, Chris Morrison. Yo, welcome. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you all once again for being here. Uh, it's it's a great honor. It's it's a great opportunity for the people, the community, to learn about, um, you know, how they can learn. Um, and so we, I, I think we've we've pulled together some of the, the best and and brightest minds of those who cultivate the best and brightest minds. So uh, thank you for your time here. Um, so let's just uh, go down the list, I guess, in the same order, because that's an order. So uh, Mr. Samuel. Okay. Uh, let us see if we can go into presenter view. For those of you who have maybe played or seen YouTube videos of the game Facade, the interactive drama Facade, the creator of that, Michael Mateus, was my PhD advisor. So I, I learned from the guy who made that, if you've seen that. Uh, I myself work on a large variety of projects, most of which 
totally sucked, but a couple of them I was a little proud of. One was the social simulation game Prom Week. Prom Week was a research project that was also intended to be a polished game that wanted to uh, test out uh, social psychology theory, specifically a dramaturgical analysis by Irving Goffman. There's also a little bit of Eric Byrne in there. And so as part of this, me and my you know, friends made this whole game that had this social AI system. We uh, used that to power this AI driven game where you're basically this Machiavellian mastermind manipulating high school students to naturally want to you know, take certain social actions in the week leading up to prom. Uh, this was partly an interactive narrative experiment trying to, you know, make the claim that our AI system enables for a wide variety of unique playable experiences and also like for those stories to be meaningful, uh, to leave something in the hearts and minds of the players. And we're very happy that we won a bunch of awards as part of this project. So we want to say mission accomplished. Uh, in addition to having a PhD in computer science, I also have a, a background as an actor, a little, little headshot. And this is relevant for another game that I made in my PhD studies, the game Bad News. Bad News is a game that's partly artificial intelligence, procedural content generation experiments, but it's also a theatrical performance piece. It involves an actor and a player uh, playing a game, having conversations in real time. We've played all over the world, uh, we've toured internationally, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, and the basic premise of the game involves procedurally generating towns. All of the townspeople talk to each other. They have their own theory of minds about the state of the world. And you, as the player, take on the role of a mortician's assistant and needs to find out a John Doe or a Jane Doe who has passed away find their next of kin in this virtual world uh, and notify them of the death. Uh, again, experimenting in storytelling and AI. Uh, and also again, uh, won a bunch of awards uh, at computer science venues, at independent game venues, uh, also at film and art venues, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Uh, so we're very proud and uh, happy about that. And so this idea, like this, that was work that I did in my PhD studies, and that's what I try to bring to the program at the University of New Orleans. I try to teach my students and structure classes in such a way that they understand the technical know-how to actually create games, but that they're also inspired to try and create innovative new forms of gameplay uh, that perhaps have never been before explored. So get both halves of your brain going. Uh, without going into too much detail, game design at UNO is part of the computer science department. And so students who study game design at UNO are getting a fully fledged computer science degree, opening up all of the doors that computer science degree normally would enter. If you choose to attend UNO, you'll be confronted, surrounded by friendly, happy students and faculty, more than happy to help answer any questions. The computer science department goes above and beyond to ensure the success of every student. This is Dr. Sam Hoyt, our student support specialist, absolutely making sure that no student gets left behind. Uh, here's a bunch of generic images of people with computer science degrees being successful and happy. You too can be one person like this if you graduate from the University of New Orleans computer science department. We have four different concentrations. So even if you're so confident that you want to go into game design and then you end up discovering, oh, Oh my gosh, I love cybersecurity. Oh my gosh, I love AI. Uh, really easy to mix and match, learn all of these things and more. Uh, but I, of course, am here to talk about the game development concentration specifically. It is kind of in the state of flux right now. I'm in the process of adding new courses. Right now, there's kind of four main courses in that concentration. Computer graphics and mobile application development uh, uh, are you know, valuable for you know, rendering pipeline for you know designing games under you know hardware and software constraints uh, but the two core classes in the concentration are the fundamentals of game development class and the advanced game development class the fundamentals of game development class is kind of a, a two-fold course uh, on the one hand, it has kind of like an academic bench to it. It's trying to teach students uh, a critical discourse, a critical theory around game design and game development so that they can 
uh, convincingly and articulately like describe game design successes and failures, uh, both you know through speech and writing about the games that they might play. Uh, but it's not just about reading and analyzing. It's also about actually developing games as well. Um, students create two big projects in this class, uh, a 2D game and a 3D game. And I have just a bunch of screenshots of various games that our programmers have made. Uh, they use a variety of game engines here. You can see Game Maker Studio. You can see the Pico 8 environment. Uh, this is a, you know, uh, always dramatic wrestling. Sometimes some students choose to use Twine. Uh, sometimes students choose to use games reminiscent of uh, the original Game Boy. Uh, uh, here's another Pico 8 game about an angel who hits to sustain heaven by traveling to hell, stealing resources from the underworld and bringing it back to their angel compatriots in heaven. Uh, this is an incredible game about a dimension hopping dog is the simplest way to put it. Uh, there's 3D games as well, uh, takes on Rollaball, uh, a game inspired by Watership Down, uh, Unity mods, uh, space ninjas, beautiful cosmonaut games, games that involve artificial intelligence and monsters chasing you. Uh, we try very hard to give students as wide a breadth as possible in this introductory class to give them a taste of as many aspects and facets of the game design process as possible. Part of that is to prepare them to the advanced game development class. The advanced game development class at UNO is co-taught, cross-listed between the computer science department and the fine arts department, taught by myself and Dan Rule. Uh, in this class, students begin by initially forming paper prototypes and digital prototypes to prove to themselves and their compatriots uh, and professors the robustness of their ideas. Uh, the winning team, everyone makes a green light pitch and the winning teams, uh, the winning games get teams formed around them. And then they just work on those games for the rest of the semester. Uh, in addition, there's very little busy work in that class. It's mostly just make a, make, make a dang game. Uh, but we also do a little bit of like teaching about like agile development and sprint planning and things like that. Uh, and so I just have like, again, just some screenshots of some of the games. This is, uh, some screenshots of Gilded Pockets, uh, a game where you play uh, as a mischievous raccoon who is very interested in collecting as much money as possible. But as you collect money, it physically weighs you down, affecting how you can move around. In some ways that's helpful. It means that you can like brown pound and do more powerful works, but it also reduces your jump height. So the entire game is managing and balancing your greed with versus your actual like spatial goals that you're trying to achieve. Uh, more screenshots, more gold. There's a little interactive tutorial that they made. Various monsters that you have to fight. Uh, Kindled Light was a Metroidvania-esque game. Very moody, very aesthetic, kind of in the vein of Ori in the Blind Forest uh, or Ori in the Will of the Wisps uh, nowadays. With some concept art from that, seeing the general like graduation of uh, that turning into game assets. And again, for many of the programmers, uh, not only having programmer art and having actually trained artists be on their team is a really exciting moment for them. Tarot is specifically designed to be a rage quit game. You shoot a little teleporting arrow and then you travel to where it lands. It's the only way you can move around and the levels are specifically designed to make the arrow send you all the way back to the start. Uh, Cat Noir is a game in which a cat watches a uh, you know gritty detective novel and instantly falls in love, decides to put on a detective path of their own and go off and solve crimes using their nose to see the truth behind matters. And Quadris is a match four game where you create life itself. Uh, you uh, progress through levels, getting into more and more complex life forms. You actually play the game by combining these you know, four elements, four symbols, they come together and uh, you make more and more complex ideas. Um, in addition, so those were like the undergraduate courses, but it's not just an undergraduate curriculum. We have extracurricular and graduate student activities. 
Uh, UNO in general has the Tolmas Scholarship Program that allows undergraduates to do research with professors. This is Excel Harb and Brittany Bergeron, two Tolmas scholars doing undergraduate research. You can see they're doing some paper prototyping here. Uh, and UNO has a bunch of opportunities to showcase student scholarship and student creativity. This is Brittany presenting at Innovate UNO, an internal opportunity for students all across campus to share all of the work that they've been doing, games or otherwise. This is my PhD student, Daniel de Curligand. He's currently doing work to incorporate artificial intelligence to as faithfully as possible recreate the social norms of 18th century France in a VR experience. It's really cool stuff. Uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Ferjana Aishina and her PhD student, Rifat. They do work in uh, HCI, human computer interaction, uh, usability studies, specifically in the domains of augmented reality and mobile application development. Uh, Stephen Marcel is a master's student. He's currently working on kind of a natural language generation dialogue system manager. Uh, Siraj Duwal is currently working on uh, a game a uh, version of the cybersecurity training that all Louisiana public servants have to take at the end of every year. Um, and I'm happy to say that although all of that is work that the students are currently in the midst of working on, our graduates have gone on to bright, beautiful futures. Students of the game design concentration have gone to lots of studios, some of which are located right here in Louisiana. There's In Exile Entertainment, Kinemagic, uh, and we just recently placed someone at Activision Blizzard. Um, and I should also say that all three of these students were leaders. They had their games greenlit in the advanced game dev greenlight process. So uh, it's a fast track to success. Uh, uh, I, I think. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and so again, I know this was a whirlwind tour. I think I still even managed to go over time. I apologize. So. I am super happy to answer any questions you have, either right now or over email. My email address is right there, bsamuel at cs.uno.edu. Thank you all uh, so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, we uh, featured some of Ben's students uh, last year, I think, this year. It was it was uh 2020. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe May 2020, like after yeah. the advanced game dev presentation. Yeah, yeah, that was that was it exactly. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. It was, it was a good time. Yeah, and and I guess I I should say like I didn't say it because I figure many of the people in this room already know, but in the advanced game dev class, it culminates in a big final presentation where. Uh, uh, professional developers, indie developers, friends and family all gather together to see the fruits of their semester's worth of labor. Uh, and that's always been a, a fun, exciting time. Well, excellent. Uh, I seem to have broken my web camera and everything else on my computer, but that's okay. The The show must go on. Up next, we have uh, Claude Richard from uh, Delgado. So go ahead and uh, take it away. Awesome, thank you. Let me just see if I can uh, screen share this. Awesome, okay. Hopefully you guys can all see this. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Claude. I'm with Delgado Community College. I am officially the outreach coordinator, um, which is a fancy way of saying um, I'm the person who wants, tries to make sure that students have a good experience when they are you know, entering the computer information technology or the cloud computing programs here at Delgado. Um, I wanna make sure that you, know, you guys aren't miserable, you're actually happy and you say good things about us and you also have a great time. Um, I advise for uh, the programs um, and I also teach some of the uh, web design classes here at Delgado. But we're not talking about web design, we're talking about game design. So I'm just gonna share with you guys uh, what we offer, what you learn and what you leave Delgado with. Um, so what we offer at Delgado is a 60 credit hour Associate of Applied Science and Computer Information Technology with a concentration in game design, which is a fancy way of saying um, 20 classes and you get a well-rounded IT background, um, as well as concentrating you know, in that game design area, getting those fun game design classes that you're really excited about, um, but also you have um, IT behind you, you've got computer networking, security and stuff like that. So what you actually learn 
Um, like I said, you're getting a solid foundation in so that you can then go into the next step and either um, have go and try to get entry level jobs in IT and game design, or if you are thinking, hey, four year school sounds really good, or maybe even, hey, I heard about a certificate program elsewhere. I really want to get really deep into um, character rigging or something like that. Um, we give you the foundation and then you can move on to specialize um, elsewhere. So you can kind of separate our degree into three, three parts, um, thirds. Wow, that word escaped me. Um, the concentration specific courses, which is seven classes of those game design specific coursework uh, focused where I know probably everyone here is really like, yes, that's what I want to do. Um, the required core courses, which everyone in computer information technology has to take, whether you're game design, you're web design, you're a programmer, or you are information security. Um, these are just the core, those IT fundamentals. And then general education courses, which is five classes, 15 hours of English, math, humanities, uh, natural science, social science. I think about all five. Um, it's been a day, so my counting is not always that great. Um, if you know, if you are coming from having a maybe a associate somewhere else, a bachelor somewhere else, uh, maybe a couple of colleagues classes here or there, um, a lot of times those count for your gen eds. Um, if you are uh, a high school student who did AP courses, those often count as well. Um, or if you're just like, hey, I think I know this stuff, you can also test out of your gen uh, a number of students. Uh, when they know about this option, they take that uh, because you can test out using what's called a CLEP exam. College Board does it. It's about a little under 100 bucks, a lot cheaper than um, $300 of tuition. Um, if you pass it, you can get those gen eds out. Uh, students can test out of uh, those 15 hours. So five classes down, you have uh, 15 classes left to go and it's all focused in the stuff that is probably more what you're interested in. Um, so it's just kind of like a, a broad overview of the stuff you learn. Um, this is more the specifics. Um, in those required core, uh, we have all students learn HTML, all students learn CSS. Um, all students do have to take a Java programming course, get that background in programming. Uh, we also teach basic computer networking, get used to you know the OSI model of the internet, um, what cables go where, how to set up a home and office network. Um, those kind of principles, as well as information security, because you don't want to have an insecure game and then a bug comes and everyone has viruses and they call you up on the phone and they're like, oh, it cost me money, you know. So we'll make sure you have that background as well. And we also newly um, have included an agile project management course as part of the curriculum so that students all um, learn agile methodologies, agile workflows, um, and not just Scrum, but all the time ahead, I can't think of all of them all the time ahead, but um, learn how to work in an agile environment, learn how to work together as a team um, in an agile environment, um, and kind of just learn the, the methods um, different from just you know, the old waterfall method where everything has to be checked off. They actually be able to iterate um, on, their, on all their projects, uh, especially in all their games. Um, then in the more concentration specific places, uh, places courses, um, all game design students take um, the intro to game design development course, as well as um, the game and character development course. And all students in uh, the game design concentration take 3D modeling courses. Um, in the 3D modeling courses, we teach the principles of 3D modeling. We're right now using the Autodesk software of Maya and 3ds Max. Um, we are looking to work on a having a Blender courses in the works and. Chris actually uh, has been teaching for us and I know is working with our workforce development side, the non-credit side of Delgado in how to making that course happen. Um, I know it's in the works, I just don't know when exactly it is, um, but it is coming down the pipeline. And any course that is over there in the non-credit side, if students take it and you know if you're interested in it, um, and then you wanna come and do on the credit side and get it, get it towards your degree, um, we're working on ways to build bridge that gap as well. Um, so that is there for students. Um, in the game design classes, we touch on Unreal Engine as well as Unity, but we try to focus on those fundamental principles. So that way, regardless is if, if you're doing, if you're using an open source game engine, or if you are working at a studio that has their own proprietary engine, you know, it, you haven't just been taught a specific engine, you've been taught how to kind of maneuver in any engine and how to make things work. Um, so that's that for those really core game ones. And then there are the core electives for game design. 
um, where students can learn Adobe Photoshop um, and photo editing software there, Adobe Illustrator uh, and more vector illustration, and then also C++. Um, I've taken that course actually myself, uh, I believe about a year and a half ago. And I can say when I had taken it, um, it was using C++, C++ in order to um, actually build like kind of old school games in the um, command line interface, uh, which is really kind of interesting. It's much more old school, but it, the C++ is built around kind of building small video games and stuff like that, um, which is really interesting and fun. So um, that's kind of an overview of the concentration specific topics that we have there for students. Um, this here is examples of some student work um, from this past fall in our Intro to Game Design Development course. Um, Ek by uh, Jared, which is the one up here. It was a video game about a little goblin um, that was trying to you know, hunt down this uh, mad scientist who had created him. Um, you have to hunt, down, hunt, hunt him down in this big kind of expansive 3D world and kill him. Uh, my mouse is a little too sensitive and my work computer didn't want to uh, play nice with that one. But from what I could see, it was really cool. And then Forest Fighters by Alexia is just a little fighting game, uh, which is actually kind of fun. My husband and I actually sat down and played it together. Um, and it, it's really cool just kind of seeing what students have done in class. I think it's cool because I actually, I don't teach this class. So it's, it's always uh, a mind bending like, oh, wow, what students do. Um, such as examples of what some of our students have done. Um, so for, that's just what they've done, but what do you actually get to leave Delgado with? I mean, besides your degree. Uh, students who leave Delgado and do this program leave with those fundamental principles of game design development. You've got a good background, a good foundation for you to go on either in self-study or going on to a four-year school or another you know, program. Um, students also get hands-on experience. That is something um, we have had people actually really congratulate Delgado on. It's the fact that we, you know, our students are making games, our students are actually doing things, have a product to show at the end of things, have a deliverable um, and have a lot of really just hands-on work experience or doing the things are, you know, kind of almost like that good motor memory of, okay, I know how to use this, I feel comfortable in it. Um, and then finally, a well-rounded IT background. Um, I actually come from having been at a liberal arts college. And one thing they used to tell us is we're doing the whole of the U. You are going to learn from all sorts of, you know, walks of, you know, experience and all sorts of, um, you know, subjects in academia and that kind of actually is what we almost do in terms of soft skills and hard skills um, you're not just sitting there learning every program language and being able to rattle that off you're also learning the soft skills of communication of how to work as a team of how to you know rely on each other and and help each other out and 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 work like that um, because it's great if you can you know speak every programming language out there, it's great if you know all this stuff, it's great if you have all these hard skills, but if you can't talk to your teammate or um, communicate with your coworkers or you know, time management your way through something, I mean, who cares, right? Like you have to be able to also work with each other. We can't be silos. Um, and that is what we provide to our students. We also provide knowledge in various areas of IT besides just game design. So, you know, maybe, maybe you know, you, you come out of school and you go, oh, I really like game design, but I'm not feeling strong in this, but I still need a job because I need to pay for um, maybe this later thing, or I need just, I need, I need a job, right? We all need jobs. You have an IT background to help you get in the door anywhere in the IT field. Um, so that's where our students leave with. Um, if anyone wants to know more, um, reach out, kind of get an idea of what actually, you know, things look like schedule wise, anything like that, just need to pick a brain. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. That's the department email right there. It's cmin at dcc.edu. Um, I'm checking that. Department chair's checking that. So if I win the lottery and go move to a remote island in the middle of nowhere, the department chair is still checking it. So someone will be able to respond to you. Um, you can also check us out on dcc.edu slash go IT pro um, and read more about what classes are offered and kind of the track that you go through. Uh, but yeah. That's it, um, and I'll be here to answer questions um, tonight. Thank you. Cool. Uh, thank you. So up next, we have uh, Mr. Donald from AIE. So you can go ahead and take it away, good sir. Sure thing. Let me make sure that I can actually share my screen. There we go. Um, Make sure that's coming in okay. And I'll get started with my presentation. 
Oops, wrong one. Oh, well, that's how it is going to be. Uh, cool. So, hi, um, my name is Alan Gurion. I teach uh, game art and animation at AIE or Academy of Interactive Entertainment. Uh, we are a two year college uh, focused on uh, teaching students uh, how to work uh, better practices in games and film education, uh, established by industry, working with alumni, working with studios around the world. Um, give me one second, actually, I kind of messed up my presentation. Sorry for that, technical difficulties, folks. Yep. Presentation right, so I can see the screen. Oop. Um, there we go. Um, so to talk about me, uh, again, I teach game art and animation at the school. Uh, so about me and my background is, uh, includes uh, experience in working in military simulation, uh, creating art assets for things like the Army Research Lab, uh, working in post-production for a couple of feature films, including Secretariat and Harry Potter, uh, worked in a couple of mobile games, uh, worked in marketing and production, as well as uh, educational or serious game development, uh, research-based uh, gaming. Um, we're located uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, specifically in the Light Building. Uh, but we also have campuses located in Seattle, Washington, as well as several in Australia. So what do we teach? Uh, our three different tracks are uh, game art and animation, uh, 3D animation VFX for film, and game programming. Um, the way that we teach is that uh, with the art curriculum specifically, uh, in the first year, I like to call the sampler, pl uh, sampler plate, is that we teach a variety of subjects in the year one curriculum, um, both in game art and visual effects, um, to give you an idea about uh, different parts of the production pipeline. Uh, eventually leading into a more specialized education uh, in game art or VFX in year two. Uh, so I have a lot of student examples here um, talking about and kind of giving an overview of these different subjects. Uh, so 3D art pipeline, uh, you're learning the foundations of working in uh, three dimensions uh, using software such as Autodesk Maya and Photoshop, uh, create your uh, models and texture maps, um, proper UV and workflow, and trying to replicate real life objects, um, you know, in terms of visual look and development and learning some decent lighting techniques. Um, moving into more advanced modeling techniques, uh, use, learning to use sculpting, retopology, more game ready workflows. Um, getting into more of the, you know, allowing students to kind of stylize their work and kind of follow art bibles and specific uh, workflows for what it is that they're trying to do. Change that in the corner. Um, uh, we move into character pipeline. How do we start to create a character from start to finish, from initial design, um, you know, to sculpting, modeling, retopology, UVing, you know, rigging? It's you know, kind of a big subject uh, to get to a final rendered character that can be uh, posed or animated to use in you know games or film. Um, we learn things like digital lighting and compositing, how we take 3D elements and composite them into real life footage or photography. Um, you know, so the fake objects being this book right here, as well as the headphones. Um, we move into, you know, various things such as storyboards to help plan out on the pre-production side, um, taking a script and interpreting it um, through visual, you know, drawings and, you know, block out and just planning stages. Um, moving into character animation uh, and principles of animation, learning how to make stuff move and why, how they're supposed to look uh, to give them the most appeal and, you know, everything to their design. Uh, by the end of the year one production uh, in game art, uh, we actually pair up with uh, the programmers of uh, the programming class uh, to develop a game over, you know, X amount of weeks, uh, short eight, you know, six to eight week project. Uh, to do more arcade style games, a very, um, you know, 
tight set of rules, you know, um, try not to make World of Warcraft in, you know, that amount of time. Uh, very finite kind of set of goals, um, but it allows the students to kind of explore and kind of um, get a better understanding of working in a team uh, and helping develop uh, those skills. Uh, whereas in the visual effects uh, side of things, uh, the students are usually working towards a commercial product. Uh, they, we try to pair up with some sort of local company that has a need for some sort of advertisement or commercial or some sort of uh, explainer video um, and try to work towards their needs in developing uh, a short animated film. Um, moving into year two, um, you know, some of the subjects are more geared towards um, in year one, you learned you know, generally how to work in 3D and, you know, how to make yourself look pretty good. In year two, we help hone in on those skills and more specifically towards uh, game engines uh, itself. Uh, so here are some examples of working and getting their uh, feet wet with the Unreal Engine. Um, you know, how do we work with uh, really solid lighting, more optimized lighting? How do we work with post-process rendering? Uh, how do we uh, develop towards a specific look? Um, we work with uh, learning how to do user interface elements, uh, designing backgrounds, designing, um, you know, text boxes, or just giving a visual look and feel for, you know, two-dimensional concept art um, and making it usable for, you know, a game engine. Um, game characters, uh, you know, one of the big topics in year two, one of the big takeaways is that uh, students always developing their portfolio skills and uh, one of the best ways to do that is giving a research-based topic where they, you know, obviously have to make a character with the name of the subject, game characters, but it has to be functional within the game engine. And that can be a 3D character, 2D concentrated, you know, uh, 2D animated character, um, or they can focus more on their specialties, uh, such as character animation. Um, by the end of the, you know, by the second half of the second year of the course, uh, again, pairing up with programming students um, to design a game uh, from initial concept to uh, final delivery onto an online marketplace such as itch.io. So you can see some examples here of uh, First Frost, uh, Diesel Storm. So um, kind of see some gameplay of, let's say First Frost, if it pulls up. Um, where you kind of have a storefront page where you're viewing the game um, and kind of thinking about marketing in those in that sense, as well as, um, you know, having a character, uh, knowing how to present your game, how to market it, how to um, get it out there for the world to see. Um, it's a very little snippet of gameplay uh, developed in Unreal Engine by the end of their game. Um, characters trying to hide from a scary bear. So, around real quick, sorry about that. Um, moving into year two, visual effects, um, you're learning more, you know, proper compositing skills, moving with live action footage and learning, you know, stuff like Houdini and how to make cool stuff like explosions, how to make it usable for film. Um, again, the big topic for specialization. Um, this particular student wanted to focus more on uh, character animation and definitely pushed uh, her goals more towards that area. Um, all the while, you know, leading towards the final major production uh, where you're making a short film, depending on uh, what the students are interested in, it could be mixed in with live action or it could be a fully 3D animated short film. Uh, you can kind of see the design process uh, throughout that, you know, um, entire subject. But um, all the while, again, like I said, portfolio is everything. Um, you put your work together, how you present your work is a big thing as an artist about getting your work out there. But not only that, but also considering uh, things like soft skills, um, interviewing skills, knowing um, how to have an online presence such as LinkedIn or how to communicate via email um, and be timely and give timely responses. Um, we try to keep up with industry standard trends. We teach primarily Maya, ZBrush, uh, Photoshop, Unity and Real, et cetera. Um, PBR workflows with Substance Painter, substance, substance Designer. As an artist, unfortunately, you have to learn a lot of different things, a lot of different softwares for highly specialized areas, um, such as cloth simulation or how to make explosions or texturing specifically. 
Um, but where do artists work? So artists tend to work, you know, not only in game and app development, not only in film, um, but I tend to, you know, kind of frame it as developing artist survival skills and working in def different areas such as virtual reality and augmented reality, military simulations, where a lot of my background is doing stuff like 3D printing or even architectural visualization. Um, I'm going to briefly cover, talk about the game programming. I'm not a programmer, um, fortunately. Um, but in the subjects, I uh, taught introduction to C sharp. You're learning the foundations of programming knowledge um, in the first year of the course. Uh, creating systems to drive gameplay mechanics, um, you know, learning Python scripting, artificial intelligence, and eventually leading towards the end of the first subject, working with a, a team, not just programmers, but also artists to create a small game. Um, year two of the course is focused on uh, things such as critical, uh, you know, critical game development skills, physics for games, computer graphics, complex game systems, um, you know, considering the performance impact for the game engine, uh, better optimization workflows, um, to help stop people like us artists ruin the game uh, and drop the frame rate. Um, but all of this is done in a studio-like environment. The day-to-day -day of every day in class is divided into kind of an eight-hour day, two and a half days a week. Um, so it's divided into lecture and live demos, and then kind of given time for the students to um, work on exercises or do any lab work related to the subject that's being taught at the time. Um, you know, with instructors kind of walking around or virtually checking progress and making sure that uh, students are understanding the course content and helping towards those goals of making a stronger and better portfolio by the end of their two years. Um, and working with other students to, you know, review stuff, uh, solve tough problems, or just ask us for help. Um, but that kind of concludes my part of the presentation. Um, but if you'd like to hear more information about us, you can check out, our, we have an open house event coming up uh, in a little while, uh, February 6th. And you can uh, check out our website at lafayette.aie.edu. But I will be hanging around for questions. And uh, thank you very much. I'll stop my share. Sweet. Uh, thank you. It was, it was uh, very, very nice, very informative. Um, and uh, next up on the list, we have uh, Mr. Mark Abinell. Mark, if you'd like to take the reins. Yep. Back on. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, and you see my presentation? Uh, we don't see your presentation. Your screen we sharing? Share. Oh, I didn't hit share. Just a second. I forgot. I forgot. Just a second. Here. And now I can go here and let me hit uh, play. Yeah, there we go. That's nice. Now you can see it? Yeah, that's a nice Good. gradient. <clears throat> awesome. All right, so hey, my name is Mark Obanel. I uh, have been at LSU since 2013. Um, one of the interesting things about our program at LSU is we've got um, faculty members who are full-time tenured faculty who come from various art programs and computer science programs throughout the country, um, but we also have professional residences and that's what Ken and I are. Uh, so Ken and my backgrounds are not academic. Uh, we come from the industry. I came from the video game industry and Ken came from the visual effects industry. Um, I started making games when I was, I started making games when I was 12 or 13 on the Apple IIe, I'm dating myself, um, and worked professionally in video games from the old Sega Genesis days till uh, PlayStation 3 was uh, 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 sort of the last game system I worked on professionally before I started teaching. Um, and uh, sort of my claim to fame was totally locking into FIFA. So uh, in Vancouver, we did the very first soccer game that EA made back in 1993, I think it was the first version of FIFA, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, um, you know, it was just a small little game that 12 of us were working on that we thought, hey, maybe someone in the world will want to play a soccer game. Uh, at this time, EA, I was working for Electronic Arts and Europe was about 2% of their annual sales. As soon as FIFA came out, Europe was 40% of their annual sales. The game just absolutely exploded. Um, and I got to work on about 50 other uh, AAA video games uh, in my 15 year career making games professionally. Um, Ken started a little bit earlier than me. I think he's about four years older than I am. 
And he worked on the very, very first CGI movies. So the very early days of computer graphics for visual effects for film. Um, and he's worked on Twister, Star Wars, Star Trek, Superman, just a whole bunch of various feature films. Um, and just before he started teaching, he was really specializing in Houdini. That was sort of the software that he was uh, uh, migrating towards um, as he was an effects programmer. Um, it's called the Digital Media Arts and Engineering Program. I specifically didn't use the word video games because I think it, it, can, it conjures up entertainment and it conjures up a, a bit, one very specific field. And just like Donald was saying, this field is really real-time simulation is being used in every field now. So um, I like to think of us as not just teaching video games, but teaching how to do real-time simulators. And if that's serious games, research, teaching games, you know, entertainment games doesn't really matter. And, and the other thing that's happening is there's a ton of convergence. So, um, and we saw this, I think we saw this as soon as film went digital, that our tools started to, hey, our animators are now using the same, pro, same software in games and in animation. And if you look at something like The Mandalorian, which is the uh, 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 TV show for Disney, they are now using Unreal Engine to do real-time VFX on set. So they are using a game engine with game artists to generate assets for a visual effects background production. And they're hiring game artists because visual effects artists don't know how to make art assets that run in a game engine at a high frame rate. So you're seeing a lot of convergence in this industry. Um, so our program is a two-year master degree program. Um, we started in 2015. We have 15 graduates. Very proud to say that 54% are female. Uh, uh, went across the grain for me. Uh, uh, previous programs have taught other institutions are highly, uh, have a much higher uh, male to female ratio, but so far we've graduated more female students than male students. Um, we have currently uh, uh, 14 students in the program. We have students from all over the world, from uh, uh, Iran, locally, Louisiana, Texas, California, Florida, Jersey, DC. Um, so we have a real uh, international and cross-cultural representation. I've got a parrot in the background, I'm sorry. Um, and our, our sort of core tools we teach um, are very ah! similar to the ones you heard. Um, Maya uh, for, for game modeling, ZBrush for sculpting, Substance Designer and Substance Painter for Materials and Textures, uh, Houdini for uh, effects level design, um, Unity and Unreal and Game Maker as game engines. So we use all three. Um, and we teach various programming languages, C Sharp for uh, uh, Unity and C++ for Unreal. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a very practical uh, two-year master degree where we, uh, uh, all of the red classes are um, uh, individual skills, all the blue classes are team group projects, so there's a lot of chances to do group project work. We also have an undergraduate minor, so uh, 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 we have a minor that's open to uh, students in any program, in any field, but they tend to be from like digital art, computer science, uh, 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 mechanical engineering. A lot of the engineering students seem to take the digital media arts and engineering minor. Um, so we have had about 200 plus grads who graduated with this minor program. We're working in companies all over the country. Um, our, pro our master's degree program is housed in the Center for, uh, uh, is housed by the Center of Computation Technology in the Digital Media Center. It's a brand new $22 million facility that was built in 2013. Um, and on our third floor is electronic arts. Uh, test center. So um, we inhabit the first two floors of the building and then on the third floor is electronic arts. Of course, during COVID days, it's pretty empty there. I was there the other day and I think there was three of us in the entire building. But hopefully back, hopefully again in the fall, we'll all be able to be not on Zoom and in person again. That would be wonderful. Um, let's take a look at some student work. At the end of the day, that's what this is about. Hey there, kiddo. So this Tonight, is, this is a... We're going to read a story called What Happened Can you hear the audio? to Planet Earth. Yeah, we can hear it. Okay. This is the, a, a, the team's first production team project. So they've never done a production as a team at all. And they're, and I don't think any of their undergrads- Wow. Here, they're take a listen. A variety of you hear that? And they did this in VR. Those are all the noises that you can hear in the jungle. Pretty cool, right? This place is home to the poison dart frogs, parrots, and even that tiger right across the river. 
But be careful though, they're pretty good swimmers. I think I'm gonna skip forward. This is a couple of minutes long and I don't wanna run too long. Um, another project we're working on is with um, uh, kinesiology and athletics. So we're doing a serious game that is a um, football receiver game. So this is a, this is research for a, uh, a, a football player that is, um, that is, that is mimicking a real world research that was done several uh, years ago in baseball, where they had baseball batters with um, glasses and the glasses had shutters on them. So when the batter would swing, the shutters would flash on and off. So his vision was compromised. And they found out that the more they would compromise the vision, when they took the glasses off, the batter hit that. So it forced him to focus on the ball coming at him more. So we're sort of simulating the same thing, but in VR. So it doesn't have to be with a mechanical setup that they had in baseball. We are throwing a football and the football disappears in the middle of the flight. So when the football is thrown, you see it as a receiver, it disappears and then it pops back and it goes into one of those zones. So the, the, what we're trying to do is test the same theory, which is um, if we do this visual degradation, will the receiver develop greater acute awareness for what's happening with the ball so that when you can see the ball the entire path, he'll catch it with a higher percentage. So we start the, we start the test off where the first uh, five throws, they see the ball perfectly. Then we do 15 throws where, they, where the ball vision is compromised. And then we do five throws at the end to see where they see it perfectly. And we see if there's an improvement from the first five to the final five. And that's sort of the that's sort of the research we're doing. This is done in uh, Unity, um, and all the assets were built in. We did some photogrammetry. So for those gloves, we took some photographs with some with digital cameras and did some photogrammetry, then cleaned it up uh, in ZBrush and Maya. Um, and and uh, uh, this was done two semesters ago, I believe. We're, it's still being used in research uh, in human in human trials as we speak. Hopefully, there'll be papers published about it shortly. Um, I think what, one of the things that interests about what we do, if you've never read Theory of Fun by Ralph Koster, I strongly recommend the book. Um, it's a really easy breezy read. Um, I know promoting a reading book uh, uh, in a Discord like was probably a mistake, but um, I think one of the things that I've taken away from it is really what makes games fun. And we all talk about having our games being fun is that we're teaching people how to learn, right? The, the better a game, the more of a challenge, yeah, you know, we use the word like challenge and difficulty, but really what that is, is I am trying to outsmart the game, right? Like I feel much better if I think I can outsmart the game and games really are about drawing people in and overcoming the intellectual challenge or the game challenge that you're giving them. Um, this is an undergrad student, uh, part of the minor, who's now working for professional games. One of my favorite games in Game Maker, it just blew my mind when you I, I got rid of the actual sound effects of the game so I ripped from Nintendo. All the graphics are good, so I can program it with me. Optimizes for the next one um hey, so uh, this is a multidisciplinary is program we have students who come in who want to be project managers uh we have students come in who want to be audio uh, uh doing audio for interaction in video games we've got people coming in who want to be artists we've got students coming who want to be animators we've got students coming who want to be um programmers so we really don't you know we take 
people from all fields. We have a very broad view of the, of the field. Um, and we try, like I try the hardest I possibly can to separate that barrier between art and programming, right? Um, I really like the John Lasseter quote that art challenges technology and technology inspires art, right? True great innovation comes from great collaboration between really smart artists who can think like programmers and really smart programmers who can think like artists. And that's where the magic comes from. Um, one of the projects that we got to work on with, uh, 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 there's a master's degree project. This was done with, uh, we had one computer science, students who did their undergrad in computer science and the rest were artists. And he wrote a really cool shader here. I'm not sure if it's gonna be shaded, it's gonna be obvious. Where he's got two, he's got two universes rendering at once. And he's using a shader to display one versus the other. He's got sort of a teleportation. This is a, um, so we had Persian Iranian students and they wanted to have this museum. And the museum had these ghost artifacts and they had to go through this portal to find the artifacts and then bring them back into the museum. I can't, I don't know if I've got that portal, uh, but let's find out. Let's see if I've got that part taped. Um, hopefully you'll see. I, I thought the, the shader work was really, really impressive. I had to walk me through it when he did it because it was like, whoa, that is super cool. And this was done in VR as well. Oh, there it is. There's the portal machine. So there's two worlds being rendered, but you only see one. And then you walk here, you're in the same environment. And all of a sudden, pops up and renders that scene. And now the shape goes out. So technically, the one he's in, but he's going, he's hiding one from the other. So he's pop between the two worlds. And he's always in the second world. This is a really interesting project from a still technical standpoint. Right. Uh, can't uh, 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 have to promote the Global Game Jam. We're hosting the Global Game Jam again this year. Unfortunately, it's virtual. Boo. Uh, we'd love to do it in person. Really hoping next year we'll be able to do it in person again. Um, but it's going to be online. Uh, it's free. I don't know why it says $30. I got to fix that. It's actually free. There is no charge because we're not providing food or anything. So um, you can go to cct.lsu.edu forward slash game jam for more details. Um, and uh, if you want any more information about the program, you can go to dmae.lsu.edu. That's dmae.lsu.edu. Or you can just email me at my email address. Um, please, what, all of these institutions are wonderful institutions. I promote every educational facility throughout the world that you want to go to. They're all great. Um, so uh, uh, you, you can always reach out to me, whether you're a student or not. If you want to find out more about the games industry, I'm lonely. I sit in my office a lot. I love talking to the students. That's why I teach. So uh, please reach out. Don't be shy. Sweet. Thank you, Mark. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and advocate for people joining the Global Game Jam. Um, I usually host the, well, I say usually, the last two years, uh, I hosted the New Orleans chapter of the Global Game Jam. Um, since there uh, is no physical meeting for it, uh, I decided that it would be better if we all just joined in together at LSU uh, and make uh, Mike's, um, Mike, Mark's life harder uh, as the organizer. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to contribute to that goal, you, you should join in the Global Game Jam. It's always a fun time. I've been participating in it since 2014 or 2015. I'm becoming an old man. Yep. So, you know, your life will flash before your eyes just as it does mine. Um, so that was a great presentation. Um, so to wrap it up from our educators, uh, we have Mr. John Fraboni from Operation Spark. So. Go ahead and take it away. Okay, greetings. Thank you so much. And I've enjoyed all the presentations so far. Great to see uh, what's going on around um, in the region with game development. So um, my name is John and I uh, run Operation Spark along with a great team. Um, 
We, I'm coming to you live from our uh, bunker down here in uh, at the bottom of Franklin Street in the Marigny, I guess it is. And uh, we just moved into a 9,000 square foot warehouse space kind of thingy down here. So we're looking forward to getting back uh, to in-person operations as I'm sure all of you are. Um, I, uh, we, we run an adult program, workforce kind of, you know, rapid training type, type um, you know, I liken it more to a trade school type of approach, um, very practical. Um, and that adult program focuses mostly on um, client server, um, you know, web development, uh, application development and, and deployment and that kind of stuff. So um, it's, you know, some theory, but, but you know, it's more of a, a practical approach to, or, a, a, you know, a code school type of approach to, to um, uh, people getting into the workforce. But where my heart really is and where I started um, was training young adults. I started Operation Spark in 2013 by um, uh, starting to, to run a program in a, in a um, community center, teaching young adults um, in um, just, just around the corner here on Esplanade. Um, how to build video games for iOS and Android, uh, just as that hook to try to um, provide a platform for young adults, uh, high schoolers to get into um, the nuts and bolts of, of software engineering through game development. And that's my background. Um, I was, before moving back to New Orleans, I was working in Montreal in the video game industry uh, I was a project lead up there. Uh, the last company I was working for was Behavior Interactive. And, um, you know, there we did um, all, all kinds of games for um, Disney and Microsoft and, um, you know, various uh, clients like that. Um, I was working at, uh, before that, I was at uh, Ludia, which is another a game company up there. So I built some cool games and like Ben said it when he started off and I, I built some lame games. Uh, once I built um, um, the Price is Right video game for Facebook. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But um, tonight I'm gonna talk about a course that we run for our high schoolers, which is sort of uh, preemptive to, to maybe some of the you know, hopefully you'll see some of those uh, students, um, you know, coming into your courses later. And, um, you know, you can learn more about our programming uh, through this fancy, uh, you can go to our website at operationspark.org, or you can get our playbook at finer stores near you. Uh, this is our high school program that outlines uh, all the stuff that we teach for high schoolers. Okay, I'll try to share my screen and, uh, see if um, if we can do that desktop how do i do this here i just installed this so how do i do it oh here we go let's see uh, okay can i share my screen Yeah, you'll hit um, share screen. Oh, there you go. That. Nice. Okay. So, uh, uh, I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, yeah, so we developed a game, uh, we, 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 a game programming class for high schoolers, and we had some constraints around, around uh, the design of the program. Um, one, we're, we're working almost um, exclusively with public schools. And I guess, I think I wrote this program or this uh, course about four years ago, going back four years. And the, it was designed for kids that had gone through our fundamentals class and then our advanced class. And so that meant they had some programming chops if they got through our advanced class. There we're, uh, we're teaching uh, JavaScript um, as the programming language and it sort of maps as a pipeline into our adult program, which is why we, we chose that language. Um, and it's also just really portable. Um, you know, sometimes we're going into uh, public schools 
and you just never know what you're going to get, especially in the early days when we didn't really uh, have much of a campus like we do now. Uh, now we can host uh, uh, classes here. Uh, you, you know, we have um, you know computer lab and that kind of stuff. But when we were starting up, we really didn't have much of a budget. So Chromebooks and whatever else, it was really difficult for us to think through. Um, does this thing even have the computer we're going to use have enough power to do what we want to do? Are we going to have to roll in and install stuff? So, so we just tried to keep it uh, browser based and uh, focus on the languages, the language that we were using um, in our classes. So there was just a, a continuation there. But what we wanted to do, or what I wanted to do, was walk uh, students through. Uh, to make use of the techniques and the, and the, the concepts they'd already learned in programming uh, to apply them to uh, very fundamental concepts in, in video game programming and animation programming. So, um, so that's what we did. Um, the, instead of focusing on uh, using a, you know, a platform like Unity or a studio like that, uh, you know, where it, it can be a little bit more you know, there's, there's there's quite a lot of power in one of those platforms, and we wanted to start with some really fundamental things like how do you create a game loop, how do you ride the refresh rate of your screen to uh, make adjustments in your uh, you know calculations in your game assets and things like that. So we covered some really basic stuff, um, animation basics, and and uh, um, you know vector graphics versus uh, uh, raster, raster graphics. And, um, and then sort of got into, um, you know, the sort of fundamental concepts of just 2D game programming. And um, to facilitate this, we, I chose a, a create JS as a, as a backing, um, as a, uh, uh, a library to uh, to start out with, not so much for its actual as, as a gaming framework, but but just because it had as a display list uh, a, a drawing API that I wanted to make use of, um, and um, what we were the goal was to focus on programmer art that we would uh, allow students to sort of draw shapes uh, or use a factory to create shapes. That will become their game assets, uh, and not focus so much on graphics, but really on the concept of uh, you know uh, you know a game loop, um, how to build a little physics engine from from the ground up, and then how to uh, you know deal with uh, uh, the properties of bodies within your space or your physics engine, and uh, and then from there sort of start building out games. And so the curriculum that we've uh, sort of uh, developed um, uh, sort of also introduces along the way, um, you know, uh, building on some of the advanced stuff that they already kind of know how to do. What, what are some of the patterns that are going on? How to organize code uh, into an application? Once you get into a game, uh, you know, you're going to be dividing your code maybe once it gets to, to be a little more complex. And how do we do that? How do we create game libraries? These kinds of things. Um, and then uh, just to, going through some really practical um, uh, discussion and application of basic um, trigonometry as, as applied to the little gaming engine, the little physics engine that we build out. Um, and then once once we got into some, some of the, the uh, development of games, the idea was um, the, along the way, there's all these little tutor tutorials or, or, or problems that they have to solve uh, uh, with within you know calculating distance or uh, dealing uh, converting degrees to, to radians and, and then you know calculating rotation things like that. Once we got into uh, the components of a game, then we started you know breaking things out into modules in how um, we could um, develop parts of our game as a module uh, and how these modules would communicate with each other. And then some more advanced things like uh, collision, um, you know, velocity and, and, and um, displacement, uh, collision, some, 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 some of the standard uh, 
old school type um, uh, you know, gaming tricks like rap, screen wrapping and rebounding. And then, um, you know, some, some little lessons around optimization and, and uh, um, you know, processing your, uh, the, the bodies within your, your uh, physics, uh, within your game, your, your engine. Um, and then other things like collision detection, um, adding some effects with, with uh, friction and gravity. And of course, springing, um, w w you know, coding the whole process of a collision uh, and, the, and the, the reaction to bodies colliding uh, with each other within your little physics uh, engine. Um, so that was sort of the stuff that we were covering in, in the lessons. And then we sort of threw them all together into a, uh, a game um, that the students would um, uh, develop and add features to. And what we, um, the, the, the idea around, uh, we, we started to develop um, some little libraries for um, the development of these games. Um, there's a, a, a wrapper for, for drawing uh, uh, assets. There's a game, a specific game library that has more uh, physics-based stuff. And, and all of these little libraries, especially the little physics one, the students have to, as they're going through the lessons, they have to add uh, functionality to their little physics library so they can reuse uh, these, uh, uh, fun this functionality you know, elsewhere in the, in, the, in the app kind of thing. Then, um, you know, there's a couple other components. We, we built out a little gaming library. Uh, this is just a message uh, messenger, like a, a, a little component that can that, uh, acts as a, a message bus within your, between your modules. And then uh, the big um, library that we developed for it was a, basically a state machine um, for, you know, the standard type of um, states that you would see in a game on the client. So um, you, you might have a lobby, you might have a state where you're initializing the game, or you might be connecting to a server or loading assets, then you have your playing uh, state and then pause and then game over. And so we took that abstractly uh, as, a, as a library so that we had a template from which we could just hand the template over to students and they had that working out of the box and then could go and start hacking away and focus on um, actual game features. And so some of the games um, that uh, we developed uh, as, as examples were, so, so this, this screen that you're looking at here is, um, is basically the, the little gamey framework that State Machine and you know you're in the lobby, and I forget. I think this is uh, def defend this. Uh, so they have to build out little uh, features to their game. Uh, I'm actually playing this, and I wish you could see my face right now because I don't know how to do everything. But um, you know, there's all kinds of little lessons in this game. So in the background. We're leaning on sort of some some you know flat type of art, but uh, or programmer art I like to call it. So you have a little parallax going on in the background. You've got um, a, a module that manages your your uh, enemies. Uh, you got your ship, uh, and then at the top of the screen they have a pet HUD um, with some components that uh, map to um, you know the player. You know, a little. Um, I guess it's actually a it represents um, a radar, you know, where 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 the the the, uh, the actual enemies are and that kind of stuff, and then some alien readout or whatever. So that's one game. Um, another game was um, a top-down type of thing. I think it was like an asteroids thing. And for each one of these games, the students, you know, had to develop um, uh, not just the gameplay but additional modules with the constraint that. Uh, they had to um, develop um, a module that um, uh, they would be able to drop in 
uh, the module itself would be self-contained. So the, the module might have a feature, say in this particular game, which is like asteroids, you might have a, a shield feature to your, to your game. So that shield would be a feature uh, developed within a module such that um, the students could um, initialize their module with one line of code and uh, that would um, add that feature to the game. And they could then comment out that line of code and that feature of the game would go away. And so they're just sort of learning these basic concepts of how to uh, you know, separate the concerns of an application, uh, modularize things and so on and so forth. I think I have another game here, Missile Commander. How does this work? Uh, so you can see it's the same um, framework for each game in terms of the states and all that. This is, how does this work? I forget. Uh, oh yeah. Ah. Oh yeah, that's how it works. This one has like, I guess, three missile commanders at the bottom and you have to kill these missiles before it blows up some proportion of your city or something like that. So uh, honestly, um, of all the programs that we, uh, that we have our high schoolers go through this, this, uh, this one program was, I, I, I think the most fun and most um, engaging uh, to see what the students come up with. Because at, at the, the point that they enter into this program, they've already gone through our sort of advanced uh, programming classes. They've learned about higher order functions and functional programming and um, so on and so forth. So recursion and things like that. So they're at a level where they got some chops and now they're kind of putting it contextually to use in something as fun as uh, video game programming. And, um, and they really do come up with, the, they really do design uh, some really cool features added to their games. Um, and each team, you know, at the end of the year comes up with a set of different features and then they have to present and this kind of stuff. And some of the kids really get deeply into it. Uh, they really go, you know, even though we're handing them sort of a, a blank slate and a template and there's this sort of state machine going on in the background, uh, you know, some of that information is uh, on a need to know basis. Some of the kids start digging around inside it, start asking the questions and then get, you know, deeply into it. And they're, they're leaving understanding some of these patterns, um, you know, at age 17 and, and, and this kind of stuff. So, um, so that's, that's, the, that's the game. Um, we, will, uh, we will be uh, bringing online some Unity programming for high schoolers that have gone through this um, fundamental um, uh, program. I mean, I, I can you know, show you some of the code. I, I guess some of, the, some of the folks here are nerdy enough, but you know, they have to actually develop these little modules for parts of the game to manage um, like, like I was uh, showing in the in syllabus there, uh, collision, how to, uh, you know, let's, let's code the reaction to a collision and uh, right from scratch, how, how you know, uh, how are these uh, bodies going to collide? Um, how can we, um, how, can, how do we uh, actually write a little um, uh, uh, springing uh, uh, algorithms so that we're you know calculating how you know based on the density of these bodies how much they're going to sink into each other and how they're going to rebound from each other and these kinds of things and provide some sort of fluid uh, mechanic to the way the the game uh, play feels and so to do it from code from scratch I think is really um, an important thing um, whereas you know starting with a, an engine like unity or whatever, it's too hard to see the forest for the trees in such a complex and powerful engine, I feel like. And that's why we, we took this approach. So uh, thank you for uh, visiting with us tonight here at uh, Operation Spark. I hope that each one of you comes and visits us here down at our little compound in the, uh, in the Marini uh, after the pandemic uh, subsides or I'll see you all online in division two. That's my presentation. Oh yeah, thank you.
I've had the uh, the honor personally to work with uh, quite a few Operation Spark. Uh, do y'all do y'all call them graduates? Uh, students, graduates. Yeah, yeah, gra grads, graduates. Yeah. Yep. yep. I've worked with a few uh, Operation Spark grads awesome. in, in my my professional days as a web developer. So <laughs> it's good, some good stuff going on over there. All right, well, that wraps it for all the different uh, spiels about uh, the schools and stuff. So congratulations, everyone, uh, for making it this far. Uh, thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. There's a lot of good information here. Um, uh, and I guess today's, or today, now is the time that we open the floor up to... Uh, any of our wonderful attendees who have questions they'd like to ask uh, the panelists. Um, so to give them questions, uh, I have a question, uh, sort of a group question. You can uh, all go one at a time. I'll, I'll let chaos decide who, who answers first. Um, uh, full disclosure, I am not an educated man. I've uh, sort of slipped out of the formal education system. Um, so my college GPA when I left was a 1.2. So I, I'm thinking uh, Delgado is my, my best uh, entry back into the educational world. But uh, what, what, what could all of your individual programs do for someone like me who, who spent their youth gallivanting and engaging in various forms of debauchery? I, I can go first if you like. We have, we have a portfolio as our entry requirement. So it, don't, grades are not necessarily a great predictor of future behavior, right? Like a portfolio is a much better predictor of how well, how successful you're gonna be. So we really try and base it, even though we do have standards that we have to meet, we do, we do make exceptions in, in cases where the portfolio is exceptional. We've been, we've been several students of just brilliant portfolios, but crappy grades. Yeah, we, we follow a similar method for our entry. Um, we do portfolio review and uh, interview with an, usually an instructor or a couple of other staff members to see if you'd be a good fit uh, for coming into the program. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I mean, grades can matter. We On paper, we have to say it matters whenever you're, you know, doing this kind of educational work, but um, especially in the art side, like portfolio is king. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I echo those sentiments, uh, like what can you actually do, rather what is your GPA is I think what really matters at the end of the day. I can't speak to UNO's specific GPA requirements, but I can say that the University of New Orleans actually has a very large student body of uh, post-baccalaureate, so students who got a degree in one field and one major and then for whatever reason decided that they wanted to give computer science a try. And so I actually think for students uh, in your position, Curtis, uh, could do very well at UNO uh, because UNO generally welcomes those people with open arms and that they can find like a community of like-minded people, students who maybe like are uh, possibly slightly older than the average uh, undergraduate. I'll just say that uh, obviously uh, Delgado uh, accepts students at, at any time um, and for our program specifically we don't have any like specific GPA thing there is a you know if you go under 2.0 there's kind of academic probation sometimes they, that means they, they limit how many classes you can take at once just to kind of help you bring it back up um, a lot of times people do probably go that to kind of just you know bring that grade back up um, if there's maybe struggling at a higher level school or just kind of want to make that GPA a little bit higher before um, applying with portfolios. Uh, for our program on our end, the only kind of stopgap we see students hit is a lot of the, the those major core classes just require eligibility for English 101, um, but that's proven by ACT scores or um, even if you end up with kind of nothing to prove it, we have, um, it's called ALIT um, 099. It's kind of the remedial English class. I'll just bring you back up and get you on track.
I'll, I'll just add that we've just taken a different approach to, um, you know, getting getting into the industry. Um, you know, our, our goal is partly around a hyper practical uh, practice, 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 practice. The last four months of our program, you're working with us six days a week, 11 hours a day minimum, a very structured um, type of program. And it's very, you know, uh, it's all it's all about practice, you know, having a problem to solve, but then also um, having a deadline <laughs> on that problem to solve. And, and it, that, that's just the, you know, when thinking through, part, part of our goal was to try to help uh, people with upward mobility, you know, coming from more challenged situations. Um, and not, which isn't to say that the university path isn't um, the right fit for, or, or the, not the right path or any, any of that kind of stuff. It just our goals were a little different and trying to help people get to the workforce as fast as possible. And the, the other thing I'll just add to that is like, I feel the, you know, the, the workforce, like being in a, a company on a team, uh, learning on the fly uh, when there's constraints and deadlines um, is, you're going to learn so much in that environment. So, you know, our, our, our goal was to help to try to get people to that place as fast as possible um, and be an asset to an employer so that you could walk in uh, to the job. Um, you understood the things that very well, the things that you were going to need to do, but you were unafraid of uh, acquiring on the fly um, the skills that you needed to apply to a particular situation. Oh, and you earn three industry-based credentials, but you know. Sweet. That's good. Good to know in all respects. Dal, did you did you talk about anything? I think you did. Uh do what now? Uh no, never mind. Uh, oh, you're saying wait for Megan or wait what? Uh I was wondering if you you mentioned about AIE. I kind of zoned out there for a second. Okay. Uh, but anyway, um, that was uh, a delay of time to get people to ask questions, but no one seems to be asking questions. Um, but <clears throat> I do want to give a little shout out to uh, to Miss Kimmy Thomas, who's in, in the chat and is participant. Uh, she's the, I think her official title is executive director at IGL, the Independent Gaming League of Louisiana or New Orleans or something, wherever. Uh, they host the New Orleans, the NOLA Gaming Fest uh, that's happened here the last few years. Uh, I don't believe it'll be happening this year because of COVID. Maybe it is, and she can correct me in the chat um, while I'm still rambling a little bit. Um, I, I've never met um, Kimmy personally, but I did get the the chance to meet Derek before he passed away the other year. Uh, he's a very nice guy. He does uh, IGL is like a great foundation. He's, does a lot of stuff for uh, uh, like local kids. Like they do high school stuff. But they do some stuff like daycares and camps and stuff for like younger kids. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, there'll be NOLA Gaming Fest uh, with online tournaments in June. So interested in that look at um yeah i mean if no one's asking any questions i think i think we're all good here i i, I don't want to keep you you find people up uh late into the wee hours of the evening so uh i'll give you a, a final thanks for for your time I just and, want to add uh, something real quick, uh, Curtis. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, go for it, Chris. Um, for anyone who's still on the line, sorry. Um, we're going to, like, of course, we've recorded the session and we'll post this um, on our YouTube channel uh, once we've done a little little edit, I think. Um, so if anyone was asking about presentations, Kimmy was actually asking. Um, so we'll post that on our YouTube channel. I shared the link to our YouTube channel uh, in our chat. I'll also uh, share that through our Discord uh, as well. So if you weren't able to catch it uh, today, um, 
or you want to share it with, say, students or prospective students, you'll have access to that presentation on YouTube. Cool. Um, I think everybody froze. So I don't know if y'all can even hear me right now. Can y'all hear me? It doesn't look like it. <laughs> I'm not sure what uh, if we're uh, if we're going to be looking well, at any any future education summits, but it, I feel like we've had a pretty uh, pretty great first one here. Oh yeah, I I think this would be a great thing to to sort of happen annually, kind of always always have like because this this specific month January is like pretty big. Well, it was a very long time since I was in high school, but from what I remember, this is a pretty big uh, time in high schoolers' lives uh, with regards to like, you know, going into college and finding out like exactly what they're going to do for the rest of their life. So I think it was a great time block for it. And it was such a great session tonight. Uh, I would just love to keep it going. So um, thank you all for, for um, presenting tonight. It was, it was a great time. Um once again, this has been the New Orleans Game Developers Meetup. Uh, my name is Curtis, one of uh, your wonderful organizers. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation, hang out. If you have any uh, questions or comments or concerns about uh, the meetup itself or for any of these fine presenters, you can uh, continue the conversation in Discord, which we will post a link to in the Zoom chat. Um, and um, that's it. Uh, thank you all. You can go back to your lives and Stop looking at a computer screen if you want. And I, I never do. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Curtis. Thank you so much, Chris. This is wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Be safe, everybody. <laughs> you too.